So, um, in, in this uh, fourth and last uh, lecture in this series, um, I want to uh, extend some of the concepts that I presented earlier about chirality leading to modulations in liquid crystal phases um, and talk about a different and related class of modulations that's not induced by chirality but rather by polarity, by um, um, dipolar order within a liquid crystal. Um, this work, uh, unlike the previous lectures, uh, includes some current uh, research from uh, my group and, and others, um, and so I certainly want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators on this uh, research, the students um, uh, Sheikh Shamid and Sebastikal uh, and um, Professor uh, David Alder. Um, and so uh, the idea here is that um, we're working with the, the flexoelectric effect, which some of you may be familiar with. If you're not, I'll tell you about it in just a moment. Um, but for, for students who learn about it, uh, you know, we generally learn about it as kind of a specialized type of uh, electric field effect on liquid crystals. Um, that was, uh, you know, certainly the way I learned it. Um, but what I want to argue here is, is a different ideology, right? An ideology that the flexoelectric effect is actually a very fundamental part of how we ought to understand uh, elastic distortions in liquid crystals. And I'll try to uh, persuade you of that in this, uh, in this talk. So um, let's, let's begin by thinking about the frank free energy density for achiral liquid crystals. Um, which you're um, familiar with, which you've seen in uh, multiple lectures uh, so far this week. Okay, and um, what, uh, and so this is for achiral liquid crystals. Uh, if we have chiral liquid crystals, then certainly there's a favored uh, twist as I presented to you yesterday. Okay, and so now, when you think about an equation like this, you could say there's something a little bit funny here, right? That there's a favored twist, but there isn't a favored splay or a favored bend. And so, you know, now at this point, you know, splay and bend are jealous, and they say, wait, why does twist get a favored value and we don't? Right? It's not fair. Right? And so, so what makes the difference between twist versus splay and bend, but that there can be a favored uh, uh, twist only. And can we construct a model that has a favored splay or bend? Right? So um, let, let's see what it would take to do something like that. All right? So first, let's think about favored splay. All right? So suppose we wanted to make something that has a favored splay, this um, divergence of the director field as shown there, right? Um, now, first of all, when we look at that, you, you might be bothered by that, right? You want to be bothered by that, right? And the reason that you want to be bothered is that I argued to you already that um, n by itself um, you know, does not have a meaningful sum, positive or negative. Right? That the two states of n pointing this way and n pointing that way uh, are, are not just degenerate in energy, they're the same state. Right? That um, really all that the liquid crystal has is an axis like that. Right? And so um, when you have this del dot n, right, it's odd in the sign of n. So what does it mean? Right. So in particular, if you have a configuration like this, um, what's the splay of that? Is it positive or negative? Right? And that depends on whether we draw the arrowheads up like that or down like that. Okay, so how, how could we solve this problem? Right? The key is we only want to think of things that are even in N. So one nice even thing to think about would be this splay vector, right? You take the vector n times del dot n, okay? Now this is nice and even, 
right? And so, um, if we have a configuration like this, okay, if we should draw the arrows this way, right, then we'd say, well, this is a positive divergence times a vector pointing up, right? So this splay vector is a vector pointing up, right? Alternatively, if we look at a structure like this, we'll say, oh, well, it's a negative divergence times a vector pointing down, hence a vector pointing up. Okay. So this uh, splay vector is a nice, meaningful thing to think about, uh, unlike the splay scalar. All right. So um, um, no problem, right? So that is telling us um, that it's not a good idea to write the Frank free energy this way with a divergence of n, right, as our splay. Instead, we should say, let's look at n times the divergence of n, this thing as a vector quantity squared, right? So at this point, of course, you're going to laugh at me, right, because this thing is exactly the same thing as this thing, right? Because n is a, a unit vector, right? And so I have uh, a unit vector times something magnitude squared, right? That is identically equal to the something squared, the magnitude squared. Um, but this is still a nice thing to think about from this sort of theoretical ideology point of view, because now, if I want to think of a favored display, I could say, why doesn't my free energy have something like this, right? It's display vector minus a favored splay vector squared, right? So the same way that with twist, I have a twist scalar minus the favored twist scalar, right? Here it would have to be something with vectors, right? So, um, could I have a model with this favored splay vector? What would it mean? Well, if I have a splay vector like this, right, it would be giving a director field like that, right? Or a splay, favorite splay vector like this, it would give a director field like that, right? And the thing to notice is that it um, breaks the symmetry between n and negative n, right? I've spent the last three lectures persuading you that there is a symmetry, but now the favorite splay vector slightly breaks it, right? Or in particular, right, if you regard each of these lines as representing a distribution of molecules, right, each of those lines is a thousand molecules, say, with 500 pointing up and 500 pointing down, right? Now we're slightly breaking the symmetry, Maybe we'll have, you know, 510 pointing up and 490 pointing down, or something like that, right? So it means that there is some slight polar order on top of the nomadic order, right? So the um, um, uh, possibility of a favorite split is associated with the possibility of slightly breaking the nomadic symmetry down to get something which has a little bit of polar order. And those two things should have to be proportional to each other. The favorite display proportional to the polar order. If you want to regard that on a microscopic point of view, you could say, suppose we have cone-shaped molecules, right? If there's no polar order, then you have a distribution like this, where half of them are pointing up, half of them are pointing down, right? If you have a splay, uh, then uh, more of them will point up than point down, right? There still will be populations each way, but there'll be slightly different populations, okay? Now, the way I've drawn it for you, this is uh, just a point about statistics, right? I haven't talked to you about electrostatics. But in general, if you have molecules that have two different kinds of ends, there will certainly be some electric dipole moment on each molecule, right? If there's no symmetry that forbids an electrostatic dipole moment, then there will be some, at least a little, electrostatic dipole moment. 
And now, when you have a population like that, a population difference like that, uh, then the electrostatic dipole moments won't cancel anymore. So there must be some net electrostatic polarization associated with the distribution like this, right? So if this occurs, you ought to be able to detect it with uh, electrical measurements, right? And so there should be some electrical signal associated with this, but it's not fundamentally an electric effect. It's a statistical effect. So, here, I can imagine now a few types of ways this could show up in experiments, right? Some of which are well established by other people and some of which are speculative, right? So, first of all, let's think about the, the flexoelectric effect, right? So the flexoelectric effect um, is an effect where people um, in, uh, apply a splay and get an electrostatic polarization, right? In general, when you have these, these compound words for effects, the first half of the word means the cause, and the second half of the word means the effect, right? So here, the cause is a flex and display, the result is uh, electricity. Okay? So here, you can say, let's take a, a model where there's a free energy that has this combination of things, right? The free energy is coupling the splay vector and the polarization. And then there's going to be some other term in the polarization, excuse me, in the free energy, that resists polar order, right? This is a material that does not naturally tend to have polar order. And so there's going to be something in the free energy that resists polar order, um, what perhaps for entropic reasons, perhaps for electrostatic reasons, perhaps both. Uh, okay, so you've got this combination of these two things, right? In, uh, in, in uh, the dependence of free energy on polarization, if we then minimize over the polarization, then it shows that there's a polarization which is linearly proportional to the applied splay. Okay? And the constant of proportionality is what people call the flexoelectric coefficient uh, E1, the splay flexoelectric coefficient. Okay? So, um, when, when uh, uh, this is something that's well established and that people have been measuring in uh, liquid crystals for many years. Uh, so here, you know, we get some, some model for how big it is in terms of these parameters in the land up here. Okay. Uh, we could also work backwards, right? Most physical effects work either forwards or backwards, right? So we could say, let's apply an electric field and induce a polarization, right? Then that polarization ought to induce uh, a splay, right? So here, here's a model of free energy where we have this uh, coupling between splay and polarization. And then there's a term that looks like a polarization squared, right? And then a term that's this coupling between electric field and polarization. Okay, so now for applying the electric field, the um, system will relapse its polarization and its splay, and so we can minimize the free energy over both of those things, and we see now they're both uh, going to come out to be proportional to the applied electric field. Alright, so those are two effects, uh, the flex electric effect and the converse flex electric effect which are you know, well established in the liquid crystal literature. Um, and, and an interesting possibility that's not so well established, right, is what if we had a material that um, has a natural tendency to make polar order, right? Now most liquid crystals 
don't do this, right? Most liquid crystals don't have any natural polar order. Um, um, they uh, only have pneumatic order, right? But suppose we had a situation where um, there was a natural tendency to form polar order, where the molecules tend to fit together like stacking cones on top of each other, right? If the molecules were shaped like bowls, for example, can I have a light for a second, Kristen? Yes, what if you had you know, molecules shaped like bowls and so like that, right? And then they would uh, you know, stack together like this. Okay, so this is not a normal thing for liquid crystals to do, but maybe in some exceptional situations they would do it. Okay, what would happen then, right? Well, then there would be some natural favored value for the polar order, and it would couple then to display, and you'd get a phase that has a natural favored value of display. Right? And so, unlike a typical pneumatic liquid crystal, it would not tend to be uniform. Right? It would have some built-in splay modulation. The same way that a cholesteric liquid crystal has a built-in um, um, twist modulation. So that would be if you were in a phase that has spontaneous polar order. What if you're not exactly in a phase that has spontaneous polar order, you're just near a phase that has such order, right? And so suppose there's a, you know, a phase diagram and you know, at, at 10 degrees Celsius, there's a transition from um, you know, a, a high temperature non-polar pneumatic to a low temperature polar phase, okay? So suppose that's at 10 Celsius, and you're doing an experiment at 20 Celsius, right? 11 Celsius, right? What if you get near that temperature? Well, um, we would expect then that as you approach the phase transition, that the system would be highly susceptible to any kind of polar perturbations. Right? The same way that, say, a magnet has a susceptibility to a magnetic field. And when you get close to a phase transition, that susceptibility goes up. Right? And so, you could have a situation like this, right? Where if there's zero electric field, and you look at the polar order or the display, right? then at zero field, at high temperature it's zero, and then at the transition, these things both start to diverge, right? Whereas, if you are at um, some small but non-zero field, then um, you would get a little bit of a response at high temperature. And then as you approach the phase transition temperature, this response would get bigger and bigger, and hence the plot like that. Uh, all right. And so, um, from that point of view, the flexoelectric effect is a sort of susceptibility, like a magnetic susceptibility, and it would get bigger as you approach this transition for statistical reasons. So, that's my story for favored splay, okay? Um, what about bent? Well, it, there, it's essentially the same story, right? With bend, we are thinking about a distortion of the liquid crystal that um, looks like this. Okay? And so, now we want to say, can there be a favored value of this bend distortion? Right. Well, the bend distortion is associated with a bend vector, like that. All right. 
and I want to say, can there be a favored bend vector B? Right? Which would, bend vector B would be associated with this kind of a director field. Okay? Well, what you'll notice here is the same way that um, the display vector breaks the symmetry between going up and down along the director field, right? the bend vector breaks the symmetry around the vector field. Right? So the ordinary pneumatic phase is a uniaxial phase right? that all the directions perpendicular to n are the same. Right? A favored bend vector would break that symmetry, right? So that now uh, one direction that's transverse to n would be special compared to all the other directions transverse to n. That would most likely occur in um, a system where the molecules are shaped like bananas, right? If you have banana-shaped molecules with that kind of distortion, right? then in the phase with no polar order, the bananas are randomly oriented about the um, director, right? That uh, the, the non-polar state has a distribution of bananas in all directions like that. Okay? And in this hypothetical polar state, um, we're breaking that symmetry. And we're tending to bias it so that more bananas are pointing this way rather than this way or that way. Right? And then that change in population is associated with a favored value of the bed. Right? And now my various scenarios that I showed you for the display uh, flex electric effect uh, carry through here as well. Right? And so um, we could uh, apply a bend and induce a polarization. A polarization now which would be perpendicular to the director field rather than parallel to the director field. And so that makes a prediction for the bend flex electric coefficients, uh, E3. Um, and my other scenarios work also to get a converse flexoelectric effect where we uh, apply an electric field and induce a polarization and induce bend. Um, and likewise, uh, so, so number one and number two are again well established in many years of liquid crystal research. Um, my number three and number four are more uh, speculative that maybe there could be a phase with spontaneous polar order and in that phase you would have a spontaneous bend and near that phase, but not in it, you would just have a big bend flexoelectric effect. Right. That's speculative but maybe not, right? That there, there is a big class of liquid crystal molecules with banana shapes, right? Commonly called bent core liquid crystals. Um, and um, people have studied both nomadic and symmetric phases of bent core liquid crystals. Um, and in the nomadic phase of bent core liquid crystals, there, there is, in fact, a large flexoelectric effect. And my, my colleague, um, um, Anto Yakli at uh, Kent State, um, has done measurements of the bend flexoelectric effect uh, in bent core liquid crystals and finds that it is way bigger, like four orders of magnitude bigger, um, in, in that system than in typical rod-like liquid crystals. And so it makes sense that um, molecules with a pronounced banana-like shape would have some tendency towards polar ordering, if only for packing reasons, steric reasons. Um, and so uh, that um, may well account for the large flexoelectric coefficient that um, his group has been observing. 
Okay, so now, let me come back to the uh, parallelism that I want to argue for between twist versus splay and bend. Okay? So for twist, um, you know, we have um, a distortion that's characterized by this quantity, n dot del cross n, right? Which is a scalar. If any of you are purists, you would actually call it a pseudo-scalar because it changes sign under reflection. But, um, uh, okay, a pseudo-scalar. Um, by comparison, I've argued that splay and bend are distortions characterized by vectors, the splay vector or the bend vector. Okay, and so um, if there is to be a non-zero favored value, um, the twist must have a favored uh, pseudo-scalar, which has to be proportional to some chiral order. Right? For example, to a population difference between right and left-handed chiral conformers of some molecule. Um, by comparison, with splay and bend, uh, there have to be favored vectors, which are proportional to the polarization, parallel or perpendicular to n itself. Okay? So, that means we can um, um, do uh, different kinds of experiments, right? I've got my four experiments that I'm thinking of. Let's see what the connections are between splay and bend versus twist, right? So experiment number one is where we uh, fix the bend or splay and induce a polarization, right? That's the standard flexoelectric effect, right? The twist analog of this right, would be to apply a twist and induce a population difference between chiral conformers. Um, that's not a normal thing to do in liquid crystal experiments, um, but I think there is work from um, um, Charles Rosenblatt's group at uh, Case Western Reserve University which uh, provides some indication of having done that, okay? Uh, for experiment number two, the converse flexoelectric effect, right? That's where you say we apply an electric field and induce a polarization and therefore induce a splay or bend, right? The um, analogous thing in twist, um, well, this is sort of my joke, right? I mean, this is not a real experiment. But you could imagine if you wanted to do something that's a field that couples to chirality, like stirring a sample or doing a Coriolis force experiment, um, um, maybe that would induce a tiny bit of twist. But don't, don't bet on that. This thing is sort of a joke. All right. Um, how, so, so these things that are well established for splay and bend are kind of speculative for twist, right? By comparison, this third line, this is well established in the twist case, right? Where you have um, um, strongly defined molecular chirality, right? That's what organic chemists know how to do, right? There's some enormous industry of chemists who know exactly how to make chiral molecules with a specific sense of handedness, right? So organic chemists do that every day, right? And that makes uh, a, a calisteric phase. Yes, absolutely. This is a well-defined part of liquid crystal science. This isn't. This is more speculative on that side, right? But perhaps it could happen, as, as I've argued with you. Um, and then for the fourth line, right, that's actually looking at a phase transition. Right? And so here, I'm imagining a phase transition from pneumatic to polar, where the polarity is either parallel or perpendicular to the director. And here, I could imagine a phase transition uh, from a non-chiral to a chiral state. Right? 
And each of these things would induce some distortion in the director field. Um, there is evidence for this uh, chiral symmetry breaking transition uh, in experiments of um, Noel Clark's group at the University of Colorado. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens in some experimental systems, and it does induce twist, right? And now we could think about this kind of situation. How would the, the corresponding phase transition um, induce uh, a system with spontaneous spray or bend? Okay. And that brings me to my last point of comparison, right? Um, which has to do with how you fill up space, right? You remember yesterday, I argued to you that the cholesteric phase is the luckiest phase in the world, right? Because it can fill up three-dimensional space with pure twist, without defects, right? So it gets exactly what it wants everywhere, right? And, you know, the world doesn't have to be that way. Most phases are not that lucky, right? And so in particular, with splay and bend, right? Um, uh, I've, I've argued that you can get a system that wants to have some amount of pure splay, or it wants to have some amount of pure bend, right? But there is no way to fill up three-dimensional space with pure splay or pure bend. It just doesn't fit in three-dimensional space. So, if there's a system that has a tendency to have spontaneous splay, or spontaneous bend, um, well, it just can't get what it wants, right? But it might do something. It's frustrated, and we might expect that it will get some configuration that will include defects. So we could ask, well, what kind of configuration does it get? Now, this actually um, brings us to a subject of current research, okay? So now, um, in the last uh, half of the lecture, I'm actually going to tell you about something new as opposed to background information, okay? So, um, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been working in this, this area of um, what happens in um, systems that have a tendency towards spontaneous sway or spontaneous spin. Um, I thought I was the first person to think about this question. Um, I subsequently discovered that Ivan Dozov did uh, something very similar in 2001. And then I found out that Bob Meyer did something like this in 1973. Um, uh, 1973? Um, but, 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 okay, so, so be it. He, he was ahead of his time. All right, so uh, now uh, there is a lot of experimental work going on, and it has become a very sort of uh, trendy subject, uh, and there are current experiments from these various uh, research groups. But was there a question here behind the tripod? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. So among all the comparisons that you gave us about the spray, bend, and twist, isn't this the last one, which is the reason why in the expression of the free energy, you didn't put any part for the uh, spray and, and bend and only have favorite favorite twist because there is no frustration No, no, I, I, I don't think that's yet. Um, okay. Um, um, because I the frustration has to do with um, a competition between what works locally versus what fits in space globally, right? Um, the free energy, it's the free energy density, right, ought to express the, the favored local structure, right? And so if there is some low energy configuration of the molecules that is ideal locally, right, that should be the minimum of the local free energy density at any particular point, right? And then, um, as you uh, extend the configuration to fill up more space, right, um, it may well be that that configuration 
doesn't extend, right? That it only works over some small length scale. Um, but that's not a reason to exclude it from the free energy, right? That just tells you that the integrated free energy uh, has to have um, um, you know, favorable regions and unfavorable regions. Um, so, so no, I don't think that's why it's left out of the description, right? I think the reason why it's left out of the description is just that people wanted to make a description for pneumatic phases that don't have polarity, right? And so now um, this is a kind of generalized pneumatic phase that could have a little bit of polarity. Okay, so this is actually a very current subject of liquid crystal research with these uh, experiments. Um, and um, uh, so here I want to try to present the theory to you, you know, with my, my version of the theory. Um, and um, this is done with two approaches that go together. Um, one uh, of uh, lab simulations and one of uh, Landau theory. Okay, so let me begin with the lattice simulations. Right. So, um, I I've told you in earlier lectures about the Isaac model, right? A simple lattice model for uh, spins that can have two possible states, right? Either up or down. Right? Um, Robin has told you about other kinds of lattice models, right? She's told you, for example, about the uh, XY model, right, where on each uh, site on a lattice, there's some uh, vector that can point at any direction in the XY plane. Right? Um, or you could make a lattice model where on each site there's a vector that can point in any direction in three-dimensional space. Right? That's the Heisenberg model of magnetism. Um, and if you want to make a model for liquid crystals, for normal pneumatic liquid crystals, um, you could make a model where there are double-headed arrows on each side, or lines on each side. And Robin has shown you that that can be represented by an interaction between nearest neighbors uh, that's proportional to ni dot nj squared. Okay. Um, um, that is called the uh, lateral lasher model of pneumatic crystals on a lattice. Um, suppose you wanted to generalize that model to describe this kind of phase that I'm proposing to you, right? a, a phase that has strong pneumatic order and a little bit of polar order. Okay. Well, um, we, we can do that, and we can do it in, in slightly different ways to describe either you know, pear-shaped, cone-shaped molecules versus banana-shaped molecules. Okay. If we're dealing with cone-shaped molecules, right, we can make a model that has this non-polar pneumatic interaction, the Ni dot Nj, squared plus a little bit of the polar interaction, a small term proportional to ni dot nj, which breaks the pneumatic symmetry. Okay? And then we would want to put in the flexoelectric coupling, right? The fact that if you break the pneumatic symmetry, um, then that makes a tendency towards splay of the director field. And this coupling does that thing. And it's not obvious why this coupling does that thing, but take my word for it. Um, similarly, if we wanted to do the same sort of thing for banana-shaped molecules, okay, then we would have to say that um, on each lattice site, there are actually two vectors, right? There's this main director of the liquid crystal molecules, and there's this sideways vector, a transverse vector, which represents the um, um, dipole moment, right? This 
banana vector B. Okay, and then the interaction between uh, neighboring lattice would be the usual nomadic interaction of the ends, okay, plus a polar interaction of the Bs that tends to favor, you know, order with the bananas aligned like this, okay. There might also be a term that favors um, biaxial nomadic ordering, that is ordering where the bananas could be aligned, either this way or this way, and those things would both be good. Okay. And then we need the flexoelectric term that it says if there's polar order of the Bs, that tends to make a bend of the ends of the nomadic orientation. Um, and this uh, messy looking coupling does that, although it's not obvious just looking at it. So, um, we've got that, and we could also put in an electric field coupling to the net um, moment. Right? So, this should be a lattice model that represents the kind of situation that I'm describing to you. And so, um, uh, my students have simulated these models, uh, both the display case and the bend case. Uh, let me show you results from the bend case. Right? In this situation, uh, as we vary the temperature and vary the um, strength of the polar coupling, like this, okay, we can get a phase diagram that shows an isotropic phase, the uniaxial pneumatic phase, uh, biaxial pneumatic phase, and then a polar phase out here, right? A phase that does have spontaneous polar order, and that spontaneous polar order is coupled to uh, bend, right? And tends to favor some bend. And so then, look at the system. See, what does it look like? Right? Well, there are uh, different structures that can occur. Right? One structure, is uh, this thing that has a combination of twist and bend, right? As seen from this uh, side view, right? So what you have here is a structure that's a little bit related to a colosteric liquid crystal, right? In a colosteric liquid crystal, you have a helical axis that's vertical, and the director field is perpendicular to the helical axis and it twists around like that. Okay. Here, in this structure, we have a helical axis that's vertical, and then the molecules are tilted with respect to the helical axis. So as you go upwards, the whole structure rotates around a cone. So this kind of structure has a combination of twist and bend. Right? And so, um, you know, it's impossible to fill up space with pure bend, but you can fill up space with this combination of twist and bend. Right? So now, the, the bend is favorable. The system wants to have a certain amount of bend. Right? The twist is unfavorable. This having twist costs free energy, but the system is willing to pay the price of having some twist in order to get the nice negative free energy associated with the bed. And so this structure is the compromise structure, right, that it can achieve in response to its geometric frustration. Now, you'll notice that this structure does not actually have defects, right? It has this nice precession going around like that, and so, but, but uh, that, that is free of defects. It's, it's the same kind of twist and bend everywhere. And so the system does not have to have defects. It only has to have twist as it responds to the frustration. Um, this is 
is actually the structure that seems to occur in experiments, right? In the groups that I listed on the previous slide, um, when they report this kind of effect, they only report this sort of structure, which uh, uh, occurs in the lab. It occurs with a remarkably small length scale. It has a helical pitch of about eight nanometers, right? In contrast with the microns, that's common for polysteric crystals, but it does occur. An alternative possibility um, that uh, can also show up in these simulations right, is um, the combination of bend and splay as opposed to bend and twist. Right? So this can fill up space where the director field is in the plane everywhere, right? And so in the plane, it can have a distortion that comes around like this, right? That's one sense of bend. And then it goes back, goes around like that. And then it alternates. Up like this, one bend, down like that, the opposite bend, right? So this structure makes a combination of splay and bend. Um, um, it uh, uh, does have defect walls, right? Because there are some regions where it's mostly bend and then other regions where it's mostly splay. And uh, so you could say the regions with mostly bend, those are the good regions, right? The regions with mostly splay are the defects, right? But this you know, could be uh, a structure that uh, comes out of the simulation. Um, this has not been observed yet in experiments, as far as I know. So to understand the relative stability of these two things, um, we can do a, a Landau theory, where we have the uh, usual Frank free energy, we have the coupling between bend and polarization. Right? And then we can put in this um, expansion in powers of the polar order to see what happens near a transition from uh, the non-polar phase to the polar phase, where this coefficient is varying as a function of temperature. Uh, and then we can put in assumptions for what's the configuration in the, um, in the twist bend phase or in the display bend phase um, and minimize over parameters in each of these assumptions. Um, and that minimization uh, well, shows the possibility of a phase transition. Um, and uh, it shows the free energy in the ordered, modulated polar phase. Um, and so the relative free energies of these two things um, depend on the elastic constants for twist versus splay, right? Which makes sense, right? Because in one case, you're having the good bend plus a little bit of bad twist, right? In the other case, you have the good bend plus a little bit of bad splay. And so which of those two things is favorable depends on how bad is twist versus how bad is splay. Um, but for a big range of parameters, um, it does seem that the twist bend is the favorable one. Uh, and so um, that works out just with the experiment. Okay. So I told you that my group found this. My students found this in simulations um, and then found out that other people had already been doing work along related lines and even Bob Meyer back in the 70s. Um, the thing is, my students kept doing more simulations after they found the things that they were supposed to find. And then they found more stuff. And so they actually remarkably um, found um, more complicated structures that have three-dimensional modulations. They don't just have the simple one-dimensional modulation, 
in the twist bend phase or the splay bend phase, but instead you can get things that have either a two-dimensional modulation that looks like um, a lattice of, of uh, hedgehogs right, in, in the two-dimensional plane, right? or this three-dimensional thing that looks like a lattice of hedgehogs in, in 3D. Okay? And so you can ask, well, what's, what's going on in those more complicated structures? Well, I'm going to argue that those things are analogous to the blue phases that I showed you at the very end of the lecture yesterday. Right? The blue phases are very complicated, three-dimensionally modulated phases that occur in chiral liquid crystals. Right? Chiral liquid crystals normally form holosteric phases, but in certain situations they can form these blue phases with much more complicated modulations. I'm going to say this is yet another analogy between chirality and polarity that um, polarity can lead to these 2D or 3D modulations as well, making structures which I want to call uh, polar blue phases. Um, and these are structures where um, you know, we have these sorts of modulations. These are actually hard to, to see in, um, in the 2D projection. So let me show you the, the Mathematica 3D graphics, um, which have really, um, you know, they allow you to rotate them. And so here you can see a configuration where we are, say, rotating it in three dimensions. And you can look and say, well, look, it looks like a lattice of um, hedgehogs, right, places where all the vectors are pointing inwards, and then those things get arranged in a DCC lattice. So um, we uh, have gone to uh, model these through a Landau theory kind of approach. Uh, where am I? Yeah. Through a Landau theory kind of approach. In order to model these, we actually have to go to the full Q-tensor. The director description is not enough for these because these are full of defects. And the defects are regions where the magnitude of the pneumatic order, as well as the polar order, is changing. And so the director description is not enough. We have to go to the more, we say, microscopic or detailed view where there's the full Q-tensor that's varying as a function of position. Um, this is the same thing that people like Kornreich and Strickman did years ago in modeling chiral blue phases. And so now we'll do an analogous thing for these polar blue phases. Um, and and it, it works. We can find parts of the phase diagram where these kinds of structures are the minima of the free energy. And so hence to work out a phase diagram which shows different regions, in terms of all these Landau parameters, uh, with uh, isotropic, pneumatic, twist bend phases, as well as a BCC lattice of hedgehogs, or the 2D uh, hexagonal lattice of hedgehogs. Okay, so these are possibilities that we're proposing now theoretically. Um, do they actually occur in any experiments, right? And that's the tough question that you can always ask. Um, I think the closest thing that's been seen in experiments uh, is work with um, dendromers, right? So there are dendromers, that is, these very large molecules with a kind of hierarchical structure like this. Um, and um, some of these things form liquid crystals. Um, these can be formed with uh, interesting shapes that look like cones or that look like um, slices of pizza, right, like we uh, enjoyed last night. Um, and uh, they do make very complicated kinds of 
three-dimensional modulated structures. And so I think it's not exactly the same as what I have in this theory, but I think it's the same sort of concept of making um, modulated structures. So these have been seen experimentally uh, recently, and um, I would argue that you know, they can be understood by this analogy with blue phases. Um, and I would also you know, encourage all the people out there doing experiments with twist bend phases to look for related kinds of 3D modulated phases in those systems as well. All right, so I'm, I'm done with this. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with the main um, conclusions of this work. Right, the, the general sort of uh, ideology that comes out of my, my fourth lecture here um, is the analogy between polarity and chirality. Right, that both of them are general mod uh, mechanisms to induce director modulations in liquid crystals. Um, chirality leading to twist and polarity leading to splay and bend. Um, and hence uh, are making predictions for this uh, range of phase structures that might occur. Okay, so I think that um, wraps up the uh, story that I wanted to tell you over the whole series of lectures. Uh, I've tried to give you a survey, you know, ranging from fundamentals of liquid crystal science and you know, what determines the magnitude and the orientation of uh, liquid crystals, um, and then what determines the modulation, so whether the modulations can be uniform or, uh, or whether frustration can lead to very complex uh, structures. Uh, I think this is a very uh, rich subject, and I've enjoyed sharing it with you. Um, so at this point, I will um, conclude Conclude. I thank the organizers for um, um, arranging this uh, great event, this uh, summer school or winter school or whatever it is. And, um, and uh, uh, thank, uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate and thanks to uh, all of you for coming. Um, 
you know, liquid crystal displays out of blue phases. Um, it's a it's been a big research effort for Samsung, right? It's not on the market, but they've built prototype TVs out of blue phases. Um, and it's, it's really quite amazing, right? And, and even at the International Liquid Crystal Conference, uh, I know, don't know what it will be in two weeks, but two years ago, there, there was poster after poster of, of applications of chiral blue phases. Um, and um, it's certainly not what anyone would have imagined 20 years ago. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's fascinating to see in this field how there can be connections between basic research and applications. I think that's the most wonderful sentence on which to go through. <laughs> <laughs> fundamental science evolves into routine engineering. Well, or even non engineering. The, yeah. the well developed concepts that you just presented can really help us understand really complicated systems. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.